I think that's a key to having a marriage that is lasting and a, a lifelong love is not forgetting the love that was kindled early on in the romance and then working to keep rekindling that love. Hey there, you're listening to the Girls Talking Life podcast, and I'm your host, Johanna. If you're like me, you love time with friends. I always leave feeling encouraged, inspired to try something different, or I've learned something new. So why not continue to grow even when we can't be with our girlfriends? We're not made to do life on our own. So in each episode of this show, I'll bring you a girl and her story to give you refreshing ideas to stir your soul. Let's walk this road together. Are you ready to talk life? Welcome to the show. I am so glad you're here. Girls Talking Life is all about being in community with other women. And I have a five-day workshop where we plan, prep, and gather with our girlfriends. And the next round of this mini workshop begins September 13th. If you're listening the day this episode is released, that is next Monday. You can grab your spot by visiting girlstalkinglife.com slash the gathering project. If you join me, you will get five days of coaching videos, a 12 page workbook called the girls gathering guide and the GTL conversation cards. You'll also be able to access a private Facebook group where we can interact real time. You can interact with me and the other group members for support and ideas and encouragement. My mission is to help you gather, have conversations, create meaningful connections and build lasting friendships. I hope you'll join me. Today, I'm talking with Rhonda Stoppy, the no regrets woman, all about marriage and becoming the couple you long to be. Rhonda shares her own love story and invites us to remember what romance was like with our husbands before we were married. She says we need to remember that feeling and then keep working to rekindle it. Rhonda tells us that we have to teach our husbands how to love us and what we need in our particular season. She explains how powerful it is when we pursue intimacy with our husbands. Rhonda brings so much energy and enthusiasm to today's show, and she is not shy. She dives right into some adult marriage topics, so you may not want your little ones in the room while you're listening to this one. Here is my conversation with Rhonda. Hey, Rhonda, thank you so much for coming on Girls Talking Life. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I would love for you to start by sharing just a little bit about who you are. My name is Rhonda Stoppy, and I am the No Regrets Woman. That's my trademark. I, that's my brand. I own the trademark because I help women break free from regrets that hold them back, and I help them build no regrets lives. My husband's a pastor. He was a youth pastor for 18 years, and he's been a senior pastor for the last 20 years. We've been married 40 years this October. Wow. I married my high school sweetheart. He was, I was, he was my high school sweetheart, but I met him after he came home from college. So <laughs> just to clarify. <laughs> Got it. Uh, and that, but that's a fun story that I share in, in some of my books of how we met and f- fell in love. We have four adult children and they're all married to amazing, wonderful spouses. And we have 13 grandkids and two on the way. Wow. So much, so much love there. Mm, so much. We're so blessed. Well, we are talking about marriage today and you've written a couple books on marriage. Tell me a little bit about your own. You started to share some, tell me a little bit more. Well, Steve and I met, (laughs) he was in Denver, went to school. I was going to a small Christian school in the San Francisco Bay area. And when he came home from college, he uh, started working at this Christian school. And my sister actually was dating his brother at the time who was still in high school. And I remember seeing him and just having the biggest crush. Like he was like, like hottie with a body. (laughs) And I wanted to talk to him, but he's six and a half years older than I am. And he ran from me every step of the way. (laughs) And anyone who knows about a new church, young man enters the college ministry, comes out of nowhere. He's like fresh meat. So all the college career women were wanting to date him and he dated them all as I watched from afar. And I remember just longing for him to show me some attention. And I knew it was just silly because he was so much older. And so I just, our our families were friends and I was just going to be like, have to be okay with that. And I remember there was a time, and this actually is in our book, Real Life Romance. It's a book about how how we fell in love and how other couples fall in love and celebrating God's providence and writing your love stories. It's a great book for people that are waiting for uh, a spouse, or if you want to teach your teens about godly romance that honors Christ. Anyway, little tidbit about that book. 
But I remember I hadn't seen Steve in a while and I was a cheerleader at our high school and we showed up at a basketball game and I saw in the parking lot, his 1969 Mach one. And I knew it was his. It's so, it was such a unique car. And I got a little flutter and I said, stoppies here. I call him stoppy. There's so many Steve's on planet earth. So I call him by his last name. Stoppies here. I'm going to see stoppy. And I was so excited in my little cheer outfit. And I walked in and as I walked in, he was on the basketball court making a layup because he was doing a, a alumni game. It was a high school that he had graduated from. It was their homeschool or homecoming. So I walked in, our eyes met. I got a little flutter. He winked at me and ran down the court and finished off the game. And I'm like, okay, he's going to come say hi to me when this is yeah. over. I can't wait. So after the game, I look across and he comes out and he puts a woman on his arm And he starts walking up the bleachers, introducing her to all the people he went to high school with. And I was devastated. I was just like, I'm I'm looking down at my high school self with my block across my chest that says Rhonda and rah, rah, Rhonda. And I was like, he'll never notice me. And I, I like to tell that story because I think we forget if we're married, we forget our love story and we forget how much we longed for our spouse to show us attention, to call us on the phone, throw us a text, ask us out to coffee. We forget how much we wanted that. And we don't live in that mindset when we're married. We just do life together, but we forget those magical moments. We forget that, take my breath away. I hope he notices me today. And I think that has been one of the secrets to mine and Steve's 40 years of of a no regrets marriage is we try not to forget how much we longed to be together and how God orchestrated our path to even cross our paths. We never, ever would have been in the same social groups on planet earth, our age difference and all of that. I think that's a key to having a marriage that is lasting and a lifelong love is not forgetting the love that was kindled early on in the romance and then working to keep rekindling that love. I love that story. And that is such a good reminder for us all to go back and remember how did that all start for us? What was the romance like? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, in in real life romance, the final love story is to write your own in the book. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Just remember your, your story is yours and God orchestrated that for you celebrating his providence and And just celebrating, even when times get hard, even when that's not the person I married, that's not the person I, you know, had thought we were going to be. None of us are. (laughs) When we think we walk down the aisle, I remember thinking, I'm going to be the best wife. I am going to make sure that I cook for him and clean for him. And he's going to have sex every day of the week till the day he dies. And he's so lucky that he landed this woman. But reality is I wasn't that woman. I worked full time. He worked full time. We were both tired and we just did life together for a while. And I wasn't, I'm not a fighter. I'm a stuffer. So I'm a middle child. So, you know, my, my siblings would go at it and I'd be invisible. And so in a relationship, when things were not what I had hoped they would be, which the number one marriage trouble is unmet expectations. And when my expectations weren't being met, my tendency was to just pull back, go to work, do my thing, stuff it. And I remember the day that I kind of lost it. My husband was in construction and in the wintertime, rainy days, they stay home. They don't work. They stay home. And so he and his brother who was in construction with him were at home playing video games, which back then it was Atari. (laughs) We got married in the 1900s, back in the olden days before the World Wide Web. Yeah, that dates you a little, Rhonda. (laughs) Yes, I just turned 60. In case anyone's wondering, I don't mind embracing my age. I just turned 60 uh, in May. So I came home and they were making uh, peanut butter toast. And now my husband, I had no idea this man had such an obsession with peanut butter toast. But after we got married, there were peanut butter toast crumbs on the counter every day of my life. And I would wipe them up, maybe huff a little. And what I realized at that moment when I started weeping over the peanut butter toast is the peanut butter toast wasn't the issue. And rarely is the issue really the issue, right? So he comes in and I'm like, oh, the crumbs and the peanut butter toast. And he's like, who are you? But what it represented to me was you don't care what I do all day. I'm putting in so much effort to keep this house clean, to work full time. And your crumbs on the counter shows me you could care less. Now, his response was, I made the toast on the counter. So I didn't, I was saving you from having to wash a plate. Makes sense in his mind. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But until we talked about it, I just felt like it was his way of saying, 
I don't care. Do it again. So I knew I needed help. I knew I wasn't the wife I wanted to be. And I knew I needed to be the wife I hoped I would be. I longed to be. And the subheading for the book, The Marriage Mentor, that Steve and I wrote together is called Becoming the Couple You Long to Be. That couple when you walk down the aisle that you dreamed that you would be, you'd be the fun couple, the people that people always wanted to have over because you were like so in love and so fun. And I'm not going to be like my parents or I'm not going to be like, you know, we're going to be the best. But when reality set in, I knew I wasn't that couple. I knew I wasn't that wife. So Steve was and working with youth at the time. And I looked around at the, at the marriages of some of our teens in our youth ministry And I was like, I want to hang out with the marriages that I want to emulate. Mm -hmm. And I became friends with those wives. And I remember asking them for advice and insight. You know, Titus 2 in the Bible calls the older woman to teach the younger how to love her husband and love her children. And that word love her husband is to be a friend to her husband. And I wasn't being Steve's friend. I was keeping score of who was working harder or, you know, all of those things. And so I asked these women to be my friend. And I think a lot of times we get kind of hung up on mentoring programs and it seems like a big thing, but God just said, hang out with each other. The journey woman, hang out with the apprentice and be friends and let them see how you do life. And so that's what we did. We spent time with these couples. Uh, They invited me to a woman's Bible study. It was a precept study with five hours of homework a week. I'm like, guys, I don't need another Bible study. I need to be a better wife. And they laughed at me and they said, Just go through this study with us and see if it doesn't make any difference. And it did because the word of God is quick and powerful and it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And it pierces the thoughts and intents of my own heart. And it reveals them to me so that I have a choice to make. I either acknowledge my selfishness, acknowledge my own uh, entitlement and unmet expectation, resentment, or I ignore it. And I continue down that path, which will lead to resentment and lead to divorce. And I come from a long line of divorced couples in my family. And I knew I didn't want that. And we weren't on the brink of divorce at all. And let me just paraphrase that by saying, don't wait till you're on the brink. When you see warning signs, when you see your marriage not becoming what you had hoped, when you are not the wife you had hoped, find a mentor. Don't wait until you're ready to walk. And if you are ready to walk, there's always help. So all these women poured into me. And I learned from them and I enjoyed them and I enjoyed my husband and I LOL'd at his jokes and uh, became someone that he wanted to spend time with. And I wanted to spend time with him. You know, that's the thing when we're dating, we're dating, we're playing, we're having fun. And, and he's thinking this woman's going to be my best friend for the rest of my life. This woman is going to laugh with me. She's going to enjoy me. She's going to make me feel loved. And then when we get married, we're like irritated, hormonal, sleepless nights, and they feel betrayed because we're not the friend that they had hoped that we would be. Now, there's someone listening right now that's going, you don't understand. He doesn't deserve my friendship. He does. Your husband only did crumbs on the kitchen counter. My husband looks at porn. My husband does this. My husband, you know, is addicted to video games. I get it. I get it. But it has to begin with you. Let it begin with you because God says that he will visit righteousness on your family if you are walking in righteousness. And if you're holding on to resentment, you can't even pray powerfully for God to change your husband. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous one accomplishes much. When I'm resenting my husband because he's not the man I had hoped he would be, or he's doing those things that I know I, you know, make me feel unloved. My resentment renders my prayers powerless for my marriage and for my children. If you have them, think of that. You want to be Moses on the mountaintop interceding for your kids while they're battling the, the, you know, the Satan attacks every day, but any resentment and unforgiveness, your powerless prayers will not have an influence on your children or on the next generation. I remember those days of keeping score and the expectations, because I have high ones leading to resentment and even thinking like, gosh, I want my husband to change. And I remember him saying to me one time, you wish you were married to someone else. And I said, oh, no, I don't. I said, I want to be married to you. I just want you to do these things, you know, X, Y, and Z differently (laughs) or stop doing A, B, and C. I remember those days and I feel like time and experience and starting with yourself, like you said, are absolutely key. 
It's true. I have another book out and it's called, If My Husband Would Change, I'd Be Happy and Other Myths Wives Believe. Mm -hmm. And that book came out in 2015, 2016. In fact, I think yesterday was its birthday, the book birthday. But that book was so popular that wives asked, can you republish this book for couples? So my husband and I took that book and rewrote it for couples. And that's why my publisher is Harvest House, republished it in a book that couples could use together. Mm -hmm. Steve and I do biblical marriage counseling. He's a pastor. So we do that in his office. And so often we think we could just meet with these people and mentor them, but we, there's so many. So the book is set up so that if a couple wants to be mentored and wants to, you know, as if they were in our office being counseled, I write to the wives and then in little gray boxes, Steve writes to the husbands and he says, guys, this is all you have to read. Your wife is reading the long version. I'm giving you the cliff notes. This is the highlights of the chapter. This is what you need to know for this chapter. And then I even got to write in a little gray box to the husbands, like, guys, this is what your wife wishes you knew. And like the first chapter, it's like, you have no idea what it will mean to her if you make time to read this book together with her. And then Steve and I also made free marriage videos that you can watch on my YouTube channel. And I said, and if you just watch the videos with her, it will make her feel loved and cherished and that you want to work on your marriage. So Steve and I try to write the way that we talk because we meet people all the time. It's like, oh, I'm not a reader. My husband's not a reader. And it's like, well, you're a reader. You read social media all day long. You're a reader. We've established you're a reader. How can we write a book that you'll hang out with us? You can do it. Yes. (laughs) And then if your spouse won't read, whether sometimes it's the men will, but the wife won't, we say, just watch the videos. At least the videos gives you the highlight reel of the book and will promote good conversation to healing your marriage and giving you a marriage without regrets. You have a chapter in the book on respecting your husbands and you say, that's what they need. The Bible directs us to do that. And that's what they need, whether they deserve it or not. Mm -hmm. And that's hard to hear. I mean, let's talk to the woman whose husband's addicted to pornography and you're sick and tired of knowing that he's not coming to bed with you because he's sneaking off into the office to do God knows what. You don't want to be naked in front of your husband because you've seen, you know, on his computer screen, the bodies of the women that he is feasting upon. And that's hard. That's hard to respect a man that does that. And if he's a godly man, you can know he doesn't respect himself. You can know that the Holy Spirit is convicting him and making him feel the the weight of his sin. And even if he's not a believer and he is a man who is a good man, God's spirit can still convict him of his sin and ultimately bring him to Christ. Cause isn't that really what we want is a, a man who follows Christ. We, we don't want just a better husband. We want a man who's more in love with Jesus than he is with me. Cause then that love will spill over onto our family. So there's a story, sorry, I keep referring back to real life romance, but I feel like these books kind of go hand in hand. Yeah, that's okay. One of the love stories is Chuck and Angie and Uh, They were both worked alongside of us in our youth ministry when we had planted a church in Austin, Texas, and we watched them. It's super fun when you're in ministry for a long time because you get to watch people fall in love and, you know, they kind of skirt around each other. And it's just I love it. So Chuck and Angie began to be interested in each other. They walked in purity. They didn't have sex until they got married. Steve did their wedding. It was a beautiful ceremony and we were so excited for them. And for a while, things seemed good. But then Angie said she noticed that he just wasn't wanting her in the marriage bed like she had expected he would. And of course, one day she stumbles on the internet and finds out why. And it's what he was looking at. And she went to him in tears. He's a good guy. He's a sweet young man who loves the Lord and loves her. And he cried. He said, I'm so sorry. He said, I, as a junior high boy, started looking at pornography in my room by myself. And my parents had no idea. And in a junior high boy's mind, he was thinking, this is how I will keep myself from having sex before I get married. I'll stay pure by looking at porn. And Mm, that may seem twisted, but that's a junior high boy's mind. So that's what he did. He fully expected that he could turn it off after he had a wife that would take him to bed. But anyone who knows how the enemy works, what we feed our flesh, our flesh craves. And so he couldn't close that door. And the addiction was a monster that was having to be fed. And he would weep tears after he had gone once again to his computer screen. He hated it. He hated himself for it. And as 
it kept going on and Angie would approach him and he asked her, will you be my accountability partner? So then she'd try, but then it was disrespectful when she'd be like, you know, oh, you did it again. Shame on you, which drove a larger wedge between them. But here's what Angie said in real life romance. And I think it's so critical for anyone who might be dealing with this in your marriage. She said, when I finally realized that my resentment toward Chuck was just as sinful as his addiction to pornography was when I was ready to repent, ask God to forgive me of my sin so that I could pray for my husband to get victory over his sin. Let that sit with you because it's not fair. I shouldn't have to change. If he would change, then I wouldn't resent him. That's not how it works. If God has revealed to you your own sin, and maybe right now it's you that I'm talking to out there, It's time to do business with the Lord and to repent, which means to just agree with God that your sin is destroying you. It's destroying your fellowship with the Lord. It's destroying your fellowship with your spouse, with your children. You're not walking in the joy of the Lord. And once you are ready to repent of that, now you get to be the intercessory prayer warrior to protect your husband's heart and mind from Satan's deceptions and your children. If we are not willing to do the work here in our hearts to let God equip us to be a powerful warrior in this generation on our knees, on behalf of our children and our spouse, then we are exchanging that strength for weakness that the enemy can wreak havoc in our families. So how do you show respect? What Angie did, she went to Chuck and told him she loved him. She said, I believe you're a good man. I believe you hate this sin as much as I do. I believe that you would like to quit. And I believe that it is very, very difficult. And when I talk to wives about it, I'm like, imagine if uh, you told your husband, hey, I've got these extra 5, 10, 20 pounds since the baby. I really want to lose it, but I really need you to hold me accountable. I want to lose weight. I want to exercise. I want to eat better. And he's like, okay, I'll help you. And he walks by you and you're like eating some Ben and Jerry's and he says, moo. Are you serious right now? That doesn't help you want to lose weight. In fact, that drives you to the closet to eat Twinkies because I'll show you, right? We can't disrespect our spouse enough to change. It will push them away from us. So when Angie said, I respect you, I love you. I know the man you want to be. I'm here for you. And I want you to know I have forgiven you. I will forgive you 70 times, seven times, because that's what God calls me to do. And with the power of his spirit in me, I will forgive you. And I'm going to pray that God sends you godly mentors and resources to get the help you need to break free of this addiction. And that's where real change began. And God did send mentors. He went to focus on the family has amazing resources. Um, I love focus on the family. There's links on my website that you can go to, to get counseling from them. My website is no regrets, woman.com. Uh, and, and he was able to get the help that he needed and the mentors that he needed. And he has had victory over that. And now he helps others get victory. Oh, that's so good, Rhonda. What a powerful story. I was going to tell one about my husband not being handy, but I don't think I can follow <laughs> it up with that. <laughs> you go, girl. <laughs> All right. Well, I will. Okay. So my husband, he's not a handy guy. He does not like the fix it chores around the house. So my nagging or constantly reminding, or even like you said, disrespecting him to get him to do it didn't work. Mm -mm. And so when I started cheerleading him on into the project, Mm -hmm. his demeanor totally changed. I will actually, I will sing sometimes uh, the song from Footloose. I need a hero. Yeah. I'll sing that to him. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) No, I am respecting you. This Mm -hmm. is more than I can handle. I need my hero to take care of it. Mm -hmm. Well, and the Bible calls our husbands to live with us according to knowledge. They don't get us. We don't even know who we are every 28 days. We're some other person. It's like, she's back. The crazy lady is here again. (laughs) But when we instruct them how to romance us, how to show us love, God instructs husbands to love their wives because that's our greatest need from them is to feel loved by them. To take them to bed when you haven't felt loved by them is kind of a insult or an irritation. It's like, okay, that's all you want is sex. You don't want romance. But if we don't show them how to show us love, and it changes. When Steve and I were dating, I remember uh, he used to work across town 
And in the summertime, I would be home from school. I'd be asleep till noon. And he would drive across town, knock on the door, give me flowers and go back to work. That's all he had time for. Cause it was just that, you know, short of a lunch hour. And I'd say, Oh, how romantic. So fun. After we were married and when we lived in the Bay Area, which is very expensive, and we decided I was going to stay home with our first child. So I had worked full time and we at at some point we're flipping houses, living in them while we flipped them. It was a crazy life. Back then people thought we were nuts. I'm sure now we would have a show. Right. (laughs) But he came home one day with flowers after my uh, little one who barfed down my back every, you know, the laundry, it wasn't just a new baby's laundry. It was everything she spit up on, on me, on him, on the carpet, on every, you know, it was gross. And I felt frumpy. I was no longer in corporate America. I was in frumpy sweats. This was back when they didn't even have cute yoga pants to hang out in. So you literally felt the frump and he came home with a big bouquet of flowers and he gave them to me. And I said, Oh, you bought these at the florist. Oh, how expensive. We can't afford that. And I pulled the rug out from under him trying to romance me. When we were dating, he bought me flowers from a florist. And I said, how romantic. Now, what I just said to him was, you can't afford to romance me like that anymore. And I pulled the rug out from his attempt. I knew it. I saw it all over him. It deflated him. I had to apologize. And so what happened? I went back to him and I said, I'm so sorry. I would love if you bring me flowers, but get them from the grocery store, get them from somewhere cheaper. They don't have to be from the florist. That's, you know, so expensive, but I had to teach him. And then as the kids get older and you're trying to make dinner and they're trying to do their homework and this one's fighting with that one. And you're trying to settle that. And, you know, husbands walk in the door and they bring some Gerber daisies, you know, and they're like, Hey babe, I got you flowers. And they put them on the counter. And what do they do? They see her in the middle of dinner and the kids and the, and they go, I'm going to stay out of her way. And they go sit in front of the TV and they turn on sports or whatever. And they watch TV while you are dealing with the crazy. And you're thinking, I think you think you're going to get some tonight because you brought me flowers. I'm going to hit you over the head with those flowers because I'm exhausted. And if one more person touches my skin, I'm going to lose it. Right. If you're nursing and, you know, you just get oversensitized with kids being touching you and all that. And so you get an attitude. He's thinking he did a good thing. And you're just like, instead, if you're going to dwell with your husband, according to knowledge, you have to teach him what romance is in that season. So saying, Hey babe, I want to take you to bed tonight, but you know what? This is crazy. I need to take off my mama hat. I need to go find my sexy mama hat somewhere under the bed. Let me take a shower. Let me shave these legs because they are out of control. I don't care what you feed these kids for dinner. Get them to bed. I don't care if you bathe them. Just make this all go away and meet me in the bedroom. And I will make it worth your while. You're teaching him the way to romance me right now is to let me get away from the crazy. And you be my hero. Like that song you just said. I need a hero. I need a knight in shining armor to make all these incredibly crazy village people go away and I will take you to bed. When we do that, it's showing him, it's not that I don't want you. It's not that I don't want to have sex with you. I don't want to encourage you in the marriage bed. It's that I am spent. I'm exhausted. In fact, they say the 30 somethings are the unfriendly years. We're hormonal. We're exhausted. We're overworked and definitely underpaid. And those are the years when a lot of marriages kind of fall apart. But here's one of the things that in my, the marriage mentor, the quote is something like this. My husband says something like something about uh, wives need to understand how deeply their husbands are encouraged when their wife takes them to bed. And Steve says, in my experience as a pastor and as a biblical counselor, I've learned that men whose wives pursue them sexually are deeply in love with their wives, not just says, "Okay, it's Tuesday. Let's do that thing we do but playfully throws a text out in the day, you know, Hey, I can't wait to get home. Hey, I'm looking forward to being with you tonight. And, you know, some people are like, well, you shouldn't have to schedule it. It should be impromptu. And when you got kids, it's got to have to be scheduled or it's not going to happen. So I can remember Sunday afternoons, putting on a cartoon after church was Nana or Nana, I'm Nana and Papa now mom and dad (laughs) uh, nap time. And we would go and it's like, do not knock on that door unless you're dead or dying. And if you're bleeding, I'll, I'll hear from you, but otherwise do not knock on our door, put on a movie for them and go and enjoy your spouse. Uh, Yeah. And so I don't know how this show became all about sex, but it really does. (laughs) make a big difference in your marriage relationship. Well, I was going to ask you, what do you do when that takes a backseat to everything else? You're just saying prioritize. 
Mm-hmm. Well, and I think it's talking about it. It's having those conversations that say, hey, I really want to make time to have sex with you. And I know that I haven't been. And, and here's the thing too. Now the wives are going, but once I have that conversation, then I'm going to have to stick to it. I'm going to be, he's going to hold me accountable for it. But think of it this way. For most women, God created us to connect with our spouse through conversation, to be romanced by sweet words and nice, kind gestures. For men, he created them to be romanced in the marriage bed, for them to find their sense of well-being in their wife taking them to bed. If your husband came home from the office every day and you've been home alone with the kids, let's say, and some of you I know are working moms, and that's even more you got to juggle. I get that. I've been a working mom, too. But he comes home and you want to talk to him. You want to tell him what your day was like. You want to tell him about the, you know, kid that threw up in the car seat when you were going somewhere, you know, all those things. If he said, I don't want to talk right now. I've used all my words. You know, men use way less words than women. And by the time they get home from work, a lot of them, their words are, they're done. I don't want to talk to you right now. I've used all my words. And you would be like, okay, if he did that to you for two weeks, you would feel rejected, alienated, alone, not loved. And you'd probably start talking to your kids or your friend on the phone or somebody else to be able to fill that emotional need of just being able to talk through your day. But if your husband didn't want to talk to you for two weeks, you would feel rejected. But in the same way, a wife will not have sex with her husband for two weeks because we're tired. And if he feels offended by that, somehow he's the bad guy that he doesn't understand how hard we work and how much we do. And he wants to take one more thing from me that I just don't have to give. That's wrong thinking. If you understand that, you know, men say, honestly, I don't know what it is, but when my wife takes me to bed, everything the next day, even at work feels better. Even those hard days where I'm, you know, struggling to make ends meet or whatever, knowing that my wife wants me in the marriage bed makes all the difference. What other ways can we add the spark back in if it's just fizzled a little bit? Laughter, laugh out loud. Honestly, laughter is romance. Laugh at his jokes, laugh with him when he tries to be funny. I feel like laughter is something that is lost. If you look at Nehemiah 8.10, Nehemiah helped the children of Israel rebuild their wall. I think it took them only 52 days to build this wall. And as they were rebuilding a wall, they were coming out of exile and they had the permission of the king to do this. There were other nations that were coming against them. They were questioning their motives. They were saying, we're going to tell the king that you're doing this so you can, you know, usurp his authority. They were, they were being uh, attacked. So what were they doing? They were building the wall with one hand. Imagine this brick wall. And they were building with one hand and with a trowel in one hand and with a sword in the other so that they could do the work that they knew God was calling them to do, but they were always on defense, ready to fight the onslaught of the enemy. So what is Nehemiah's pep talk for them? Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's what he tells them. Fight for joy, because in that joy will be your strength. And I don't know why I'm crying, because I know there's a lot of not joyful marriages. And I know that some of you are listening and you're saying there's no joy in my marriage. And the way that joy begins is to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be made known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then the peace that surpasses all understanding will rule in your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's Philippians four. I have that whole chapter memorized. I say it every morning before I get out of bed because it's so transformed me as the wife and mom that I, back when those women invited me to that study, rejoicing in the Lord, it's not in the circumstance. It's in who he is, who he's revealed himself to be through the pages of scripture, through circumstances in our lives, rejoicing in who he is. And as we delight ourselves in the Lord, he'll give us the desires of our heart. He will make us joyful and that joy will be our strength for the ministries to which he's called us. The ministry of being the wife, the help meet to our spouse and whatever other ministries that he opens. When we lose our joy, we lose our strength. We lose our testimony. I love that you said that about joy. We just wrapped up a series. It was the summer of joy here on the show. Good. 
And one of the things you said in the book is the real secret to a happy marriage is not how much you love your husband, but how much you love Christ, which is exactly what you're just saying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When we look to our husbands to completely fulfill our need for love, belonging, or affirmation, we'll always be let down. That's right. That is right. He can't be your God. And that's what we do is we look to them to affirm us, to make us feel valued or worth. God created us to long to find our worth and who loved us. That's why we crave those Cinderella happily ever after princess stories, because it it's virtually fills that need in our heart that Prince Charming is the answer to all of our hopes and dreams. But God created us to long to find our worth in his love for us. And when he created Adam and Eve, they loved him. They walked with him in the cool of the day. The day that Eve ate of the fruit, gave it to her husband, and he ate of the fruit, and they sinned against God, God came to walk with them in the cool of the day. Where were they? Hiding. Because their sin now interfered with their love for God. And then when God said, where are you? Who told you you were naked? What did immediately Adam throws his wife under the bus? When our interaction with God is not, of us loving him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we will betray our spouse every time. And that's the key to loving my spouse with, with my whole heart is to love God with my whole heart and fellowship with other people that love God like that. But it's saying, I want to fall in love with Jesus. And I want to be with people who love him like that. And if it means you have to hang out with old ladies, I always say hashtag old ladies, know stuff because (laughs) we've lived long enough to learn from our failures and we can teach you what God has taught us. If you want to be our friend. (laughs) So good, Rhonda. And speaking of knowing things, you know about raising boys. I do. You have just released an audio book, Moms Raising Sons to Be Men. Mm -hmm. Rhonda, I am a girl mom. (laughs) But tell all the listeners who have boys out there why they might want to listen to you read this book. I raised two daughters and two sons. And the book is really a mom book. It's really about the ministry of motherhood, becoming the mom you always hoped that you would be. Uh, My publisher, Harvest House, said, we need a mom of boys book. And I said, I only have two boys. And my oldest son didn't come to our family till he was 15 years old. And uh, he said, no, we want that book. And so it was an amazing opportunity to help moms of sons guide them towards a life without regrets. And the audio book just released through Christian audio. I got to read it. So it's my voice in your head. And uh, my sons are so different. My oldest son is a fighter pilot in the Air Force. He's a lieutenant colonel married to a precious doctor. I always call them fighter pilot Ken and nurse Barbie because they are adorable and (laughs) they have two sweet kids. And then my son, Brandon, is a worship pastor. He just got hired at a church near where we live um, in Modesto, California, Big Valley Grace. He was down in Southern California. Before that, he had toured with some really amazing Christian bands, and he just had a heart for the local church and wanted to lead worship there. Uh, I just did an interview this morning with the 700 Club. And one of the stories they asked me to tell, I didn't, it was a six minute interview. So I didn't get to tell the story from the book that I really wanted to tell. So I'm going to tell it to you guys. Great. When Brandon was six years old, he was diagnosed with epilepsy and his, his seizures were severe. And the story is in the book. And I remember we, we had planted a church in Texas. We had everything in our home except church met in a school on Sunday. So we had 200 teenagers in our house every Wednesday night. We had band practice in our home late into the night after youth group. And my son, Brandon, would just sit and listen to the different musicians. And now he was heavily medicated because of the seizures. They put him on special ed at school. It broke my heart. I expected him to be an athlete. I was coaching cheerleading at the time. And, you know, cheerleading and football is a religion in Texas. <laughs> and I was expecting to, you know, hear the crowd glory in my son's accomplishment as he ran one down the field one day or hit one out of the park. But he didn't want to do any of that. He was medicated. And one day he had a severe seizure after about four years of seizures. And he was on such strong medicine. He missed one dose of medicine that he took three times a day. And he had a bad seizure. And I went up in my room and I wept before the Lord. And I said, I quit. We're serving you. These kids are coming to Christ. We're doing all of this and you can't heal my son. I'm done. I'm out of here. I quit. And then if you hide God's word in your heart, the Bible says you won't sin against him. And in that moment, I heard the stillness of my, of my heart, not a voice, but the audio, the the scripture saying in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And I said, no, There's no way I can even imagine what I could be thankful for in this, but I will say thank you. Thank you with my lips. If you change my heart. And as time went on, we started noticing that Brandon was becoming a musician. 
that every instrument that those musicians played in our dining room on Wednesday nights, Brandon could play. They'd give him a riff to practice or a drum thing or a piano. And we realized this situation was causing him to be drawn to music and he became a musician. And slowly it began to dawn on me. I would have raised an arrogant little athlete. God had to get me out of the way so that he could raise up in my son to be a, a man who led worship to, I wanted to hear the crowd glory in Brandon's accomplishments for hitting one out of the park. God said, no, I'm going to use your son to bring the crowd to glory in my son's accomplishments through worship. But here's the thing. If we get mad at God, if we don't stay in it and trust him that he can take what is meant for evil and use it for good, if we question his goodness, which is what Eve did in the garden that caused her to sin, we miss what God wants to do with those trials in our life. And sometimes the trial is not about you at all. It's about God forming in your child what he has for their future. So years later, my daughter Meredith, who was in junior high at the time, gave birth to a special needs daughter. She has something called golden heart syndrome and it was unexpected. And she's had five surgeries so far and there's just a lot of challenges. She's great. She's so precious. She's how old is she now? She's seven. She's adorable. But I remember going to see Meredith after Ivy was born and I asked her, how are you doing? And she said, mom, this is Ivy's trial. God has invited us to prepare Ivy for this trial. Wow. Now back up a decade before that, if I'd walked away from the Lord, if I had said, if you're a good God, you would not have let this happen to my son. She would have been watching that. But sometimes your trial is not about you. And sometimes the very trial that you think is going to destroy you is the trial that the Lord is going to use to equip your child to battle Goliath when it's their time. That is amazing, Rhonda, both of those stories. So you won't hear it on 700 Club. No, but you'll hear it here. <laughs> hear it here. And my eyes are wet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing those. We serve such a good God. Yes, we do. We do. Switching gears a little, lightening things up a bit, Rhonda, I would love to ask for your favorite five. What are you loving? What are you wearing? What are you drinking that are your favorites right now? Okay, well, I'll start with drinking because I'm always drinking coffee. No sweet, just cream. I don't like flavored coffee, French roast. That's it. My husband and I make coffee. He makes it every morning. Before I get up, I come out and there's coffee in the coffee pot and he's a pastor. So late nights are oftentimes things that keep him away from home or we're just not, we hang out in the morning. That's our, kind of our date time. I had COVID in June and I cannot smell or taste still. So I literally get up in the morning and I don't smell coffee and I look out and I see that it's in the pot. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> he still loves me. <laughs> You've taught him well. <laughs> and what am I wearing? I'm wearing flowy arm sleeve things because I'm 60 years old and I have this thing called Nongi, which my girlfriend's daughter named it when her grandma had it. It's that stuff under your arm that like, if I'm speaking at an event and I go like this, my arms keep moving after I stop. <laughs> so I wear flowy arms, either that or I have to work out and I just would rather wear flowy arms. <laughs> and I don't remember the other questions. What are, what are your other favorites? Uh, my favorite is Steve Stoppy. I have the mm -hmm. biggest crush on my husband and on my kids and my grandkids. And my favorite thing, we live on a ranch in the middle of nowhere. My favorite thing is when all the kids are home uh, for, if it's a holiday, uh, it's our 40th anniversary this October. I'm trying to figure out how to get everybody home. My son, who's a fighter pilot, lives in Hawaii. Uh, they weren't able to come for Christmas last year because of COVID. They weren't allowed to leave the island. So hoping that we can all be together very soon. But yeah, my favorite, my, I'm being a grandma, 13 grandkids, two on the way. There's two 10 year olds and the rest of them are all probably under age seven. <laughs> and most of them are actually babies. It's an obsession, obsessive compulsive disorder. I absolutely love being a grandma. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those. And thank you for coming on. It has been so much fun to talk with you. You have the best insights and I wish you could mentor my husband and I in our marriage. Watch our videos. Yes. I know everyone will be so glad to hear what you have to say. And I love that the secret is the Lord and knowing him and loving him. And we can all, there's we can all do that. Yeah. Open that. And let it begin with you. I always have to yeah. say that. Let it be. If your husband never pursues Christ, I have very dear friends whose husbands have never pursued Christ, but they are joyful. They're happy. They have raised amazing children who follow Jesus. 
uh, let it begin with you. It's not a, a you do this and then I'll do that mentality. It's God, what do you want to do in me? Thank you so much for listening. I loved at the very beginning how she said to remember the romance and keep rekindling it. And the change begins with me and it begins with you. You can transform your marriage by seeking God and you can become the couple you long to be. Rhonda has dozens of free resources on her website, including the videos she mentioned to go along with her marriage book. And if you're interested in moms raising boys to be men, Rhonda has a book club with videos in her Facebook group where she goes through each chapter. All of the things we talk about and more are linked from the show notes for today's episode on girlstalkinglife.com. And maybe you're interested in inviting some other married women to gather and to speak into your life like Rhonda talked about. If so, be sure to grab your spot for my upcoming workshop, The Gathering Project, a five-day experience to plan, prep, and gather with your girlfriends. Find it at girlstalkinglife.com slash The Gathering Project. Friends, don't let the conversation stop when the show is over. Share your stories and start your own conversations with the girls in your life. I will see you back here in two weeks. Thanks for tuning in.